Thank you. And thank you for the shoot up for this year. Uh, tickets are for sale already. Really good early supporter price. Yes, we love it. So maybe while they get this going, let's do this, right? So probably all of you, or at least many of you, heard about this phenomenon, like who, what the Icelandic team did in France uh, when we were competing in the European Championship. So I got Jam to help me with this one. <laughs> and because we're almost done, like it's the last session, so we have to like congratulate uh, and say like, to the team of Drupal Camp London, you know, we should applause them. So that, that would be the start, that we applause them. And then we go a little bit into more details about how the Icelandic Football Federation has been doing it and how we can apply that to Drupal. So stand up. I'm going to teach you because you have to learn this from for Russia. So it's pretty easy. So what you do, was anybody here in Dublin? Raise your hand. So when we did the, the big um, photo, we did this. So what you need, you need space. <laughs> okay, and we need like, somebody needs to take a photo of this. <laughs> so guys, take a photo of this. So basically it works like this. Jan does two times. And then we do. And then we go back down. And we- not biking. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started and then we can. I wish they live on Twitter. Let's practice. Okay, live on Twitter. You ready? Are you ready? Wow, so I don't have to tell you where Iceland is. 
For those who don't know where Iceland is, Iceland is over there, all the way on the top. It's a 66 degree. We are all, it's really cold normally there. And <laughs> being stuck at the airport, you know, not knowing if we can get here because of a little bit of snow. <laughs> but, but anyhow, so this is Iceland. And if we look at Iceland a little bit more in details, we are 337,000. So it's a very small country and we basically all live there where the, a lot of the dots are. So this is where we live because everything else we can't go there. But we have a glacier, we have lava, we have northern lights. And it's actually only two hours away from here so it's really easy to get over there. But we are not only known for having all the nature, but we also have like a lot of, like it's a little bit extreme. We have three times the fittest woman on earth, like in, in <coughs> CrossFit. We have like three times the Miss World. We have the strongest man on earth who is also in uh, Game of Thrones. You know, it's all my uncles and cousins. And, <laughs> <laughs> and now, since recently, we have football. Soccer, for those who are not familiar with the word football, right, and Chris. <laughs> or, yeah. So, the Icelanders, they tend to be a little bit extreme. So Justin Bieber came last year to Iceland, and then all Iceland went to see the concert. And Justin Bieber had to do like two concerts in Iceland. And this actually applies to everything, because I think like around about 99.8%, you know, when they were watching this, <laughs> <laughs> then what were actually the other 650 doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, if we take this and we move this over to Germany, so 10% of the Icelandic nation went to France to watch the Icelandic football team to play, like my mom was there, my, like they were all there, and that would be like approximately like 8.5 million Germans would come here over to watch some match against England. You know, that would be a lot of Germans here, right? <laughs> so, before I like, go into the details of the Football Federation, I'm just going to tell you about little facts about Iceland. This is the coach, or the manager, like you call it here. He's a dentist. And he is actually like, he says that when I, he has his own prex, like his own dentist office, and he basically says like when other managers go and have vacation on some islands, you know, Bahamas, you know, he goes to his office and fixes his teeth. Because this is what he does for a living, and like now he's professionally only a manager, but this is what he did before he, a couple of years ago. What he also does, and this is very special, like, Back when we were very small, like we didn't, we were not really good in football, then he actually went before every home game. He went two hours before the game to meet the fans in this pub. And he told the fans, before he told the press, he told the fans about who would be the top, like the first lineup, and what would be their tactics against the team that they're playing it, against. So he's still doing it. Because he said, why should I stop just because we are successful? So he's still doing this. So if you come to Iceland and you watch a game, you can actually go there and meet him before. And he's not going to drink with your beer, but he's going to be there. <coughs> so this is also, <laughs> he was with me in school. So he's already 36. And he was really a filmmaker, film director. And he is now the goalkeeper of the Icelandic national team. <laughs> Yeah, and this is like, you know Eurovision? You know, where the singing context text? He did the video for, the, for Iceland like a couple of years ago. Because that was what he did for a living. And actually the same applies to most of us. Like we have all like been doing something like that. Like I was on the national team in golf and handball. You know handball? Um, because we are so few that it's very likely that some of us like get to like, that's what my husband always says, like, in what national team was this person in, you know? <laughs> because we are all, like, we are all used to that, that, you know, to, to 
go through this like success at some point in our time. And you know this guy, you know, he is like, he was the national champion in looking good with braids and carrying a hammer <laughs> and representing Drupal in Iceland. So <laughs> selecting a national team is not always very simple because you have a lot of players. But for Iceland, it was pretty simple. So you have the 300 something thousand, and let's just take the women out because they are not playing with the guys. You know, that's not allowed. And then you have to take everybody who's under 18 and everybody who's over 35, and those who have put on a little bit of weight, <laughs> and those who are still in a bag. So, who, who is in prison? <laughs> by 115 seats in the FIFA, FIFA ranking. And this summer we will travel to Russia as the smallest nation ever to qualify for a world championship, which is of course not bad for a country that has a population of the size, I think of the London borough of Lewisham. Right? <laughs> so notice also there we have England on there, number 16. We have Wales, number 20. So again, how is this possible? And that is maybe what we are going to talk about. Was this, is this just luck? Or is it hard work and a plan? So I'm going to, wait. Sorry. Let me just start this again. Take the audio cable out with the CCA CMI. No, that's not. So, yeah. Why is that so? So, I'm going to show you a little video that Guardian did, and this is just a good video that explains a lot, so I just want to like, show you this quickly. We are only 300,000 who live here. So, it's a safe size of country, for instance. So, it's remarkable how well the national team has done. And in such a short time, because um, like two or three years ago, we were not better than Faroe Island. We probably went below 100 in the FIFA ranking. I think it was 104 or something. I don't remember exactly, but it was the lowest point. It's much changed since Los Lajabak took over as a coach, and this generation, I think generation is the best generation to come through, I think. Everything is slowly improving in Iceland if we look at the football. We are getting better coaches, and uh, if you look at uh, the ideas that Lars Leibach brought in for us uh, when he took uh, in charge four years ago, he changed a lot. Uh, currently, we are, are in place 35, but I think the highest ranking that we've been into is uh, 32 or 3, I don't remember exactly. So, we have risen for about 70 places on the FIFA ranking since, since they took over. And when you get praise and, and uh... I think everybody likes a little pat on the, on the back. It doesn't change anything, at least for me, to, to have this. It just puts a, a, a little bit more pressure on what we are doing. The national team, I think, has had everything correct at the right time. Um, the last few years have been spent in money to, to develop uh, arenas like this. And the hours the kids get on these fields is two or three times the amount that kids in the UK get. It started, or started in 2000, when we started building uh, indoor pitches, full-size artificial pitches indoor, and now we have seven of them. We cannot train in Iceland uh, the whole year round. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was, we had to train uh, for nine months on a uh, sand field. Iceland, or the Football Federation, became a part of the UEFA coaching convention. And uh, the coaching convention basically is a system that UEFA gives you a certain guidance that you have to follow, but you can, you can add whatever you want to it. 
a grade group has three teams, an A, B and a C team, and even the C players who are more unlikely than they're never going to kick a ball uh, when they go past 15 years old are still getting high quality coaching. We made our own coaching degrees and now we have uh, 220 UEFA licensed coaches uh, and just under 500 UEFA B licensed coaches. There are a lot of, a lot of Icelandic uh, players playing abroad now. It's, uh, I don't know exactly the number, but I think it's around 200 players that are playing abroad. And if you look at the population, 330,000 people, it's, it's actually a lot. We're kind of individualistic a little bit. So. I think that's the reason we have so many players playing abroad. You can see there are more players going every year to a better club. I think when the current uh, coaching staff took over, there was a group of players born in 88, 89 and 90 coming into the team. And they were a very good team. They went to the, the under-21 Euro final in Denmark in 2011 and they were taking their first steps into the A national team. Lars and Heyman molded that team into the team that we have today. I think we are one of the best teams in the world, if you look at the organization, we can say that. It's really difficult to beat us. We have a chance against every team. We just have to play our tactic. It's going to be a different experience for us to play at the tournament, final tournaments, of course, the first time. But we want to do a good job there and, uh, and qualify for sure out of the pool and, uh, and try to get as far as possible. We try to have a damage control on what people expect from the team. We, we try to keep people on the ground. Uh, Iceland is normally, they jump too high. Yeah. So there were three main points that the, FET, like the football association did and they touched almost all of them in this video but I'm going to briefly go through them. So number one was that they actually improved the training quality so they required all trainers to become UFA licensed trainers and that is like this is there is a, a UFA code like coaching convention and they have created a pyramid when you have the level one, two, and then you have UFA B license, UFA A and UFA Pro. So this is a guidance that or a convention that the football association, like the UFA did and they basically gave it over to the local associations which then applied this and this is what Iceland did approximately 15 years ago. And what it means is that if you're a coach of a main team, you have to have an A license, like at least. If you're a main youth coach, you also have to have that. If you're U21 and lower divisions, you have to have the B license. And 12 years old and 12 years old, they have to have like more than B if you're a coach there. And everybody who is below 12 years old, they, the coaches, at least have to have level two. And that's a big difference from yelling dads training the eight-year-olds, right? <laughs> so if we just think about like all the tr like licensed trainers that we have in Iceland, we have basically one coach per 411 people. So that's like a, a lot of licensed trainers that are working in Iceland. So to put this into context, in England, this is like one per 11,000 people. So that's one of the main things that the Icelandic Football Federation has been working on. Another thing is to create facilities, to have facilities where you can train and not only the professionals, but also the kids. So that is also a big difference from what we see in Germany. They are building this amazing hall, like indoor football stadiums, they are doing like outdoor, but that's only public for the really like good players. But in Iceland, this is available for everybody. So they also heat up because the nature, like we, we have two lines of water coming into our houses. One is like with cold water and the other one is with warm water. So we don't have to heat it up because it is just in, the, in our nature. So what we then do with all this, because 
When we drive around in Reykjavik, we, of course, like, sometimes it's icy, so we heat up the, like, the roads with the, hot, like, the warm water. But the same we do with football fields, because when it is snowing outside, you have still have to be able to play. This is one of the seven big halls or stadiums that they have been building. So that's just pretty simple, like, to put up if you have a lot of space, and the space we have. And in there you can, you know, there's like lights and everything is top class. So this is what they have been building around all Iceland because it is dark. Like now it is still dark probably for 18 hours per day. So when kids come home from school, it's already dark. Even though in summer we play also, our season is only three months because we can only play when it is light outside. So the football season is from June to August, something like that. And the third thing that they've been doing, they've been working with schools and they've been getting young people to go on the football field. And what the football association did, they basically created a plan where, and they worked with the government, where, the, where they said like, hey, this is your plan, you can build this in your city, in your little town, this is how it's supposed to look like. They have Goals are supposed to be there, and the size should be like this, and the lights should be like that. They basically created a really good concept. And then what the schools did and what the city did, they basically created these fields. So everybody can go and play there whenever they want. So the kids are even taking in Iceland buses, go and pick up kids at school, and they drive the kids to training. So they have a program, the city has a program to, enab to like, enable the kids to go and play football. So then it goes, has the big question, so how do we apply this, what we've been talking about, to this year? So that's the challenge that we're going to talk about. And uh, if we think about the structure, it's pretty similar how the structure is from the Drupal Association and UFA. So if we look at the Drupal Association, we have them. Then we have a lot of local associations. We have an like a Drupal Association in, in Germany. We have in Denmark, in France, in Netherlands, Paris. And we have it everywhere. And not only do we have that, we also have the user groups. So basically, in every country, we have tons of user groups. We have in Germany, we have in, a, in Frankfurt area, Heidelberg, we have in Berlin, we have München, so we have all these user groups. That's pretty similar to how UFA actually has. UFA is like the union of European football associations. It's a governing body. And then you have the local football associations. So what do we have here? We have the Icelandic one, KWC, which is Knattspyrnu Samband Island. We have the FA. From here, we have uh, the German ones, they, la they love the stars, <laughs> you notice. Uh, and then basically, like, we have the Scottish and the Portugal there, and yeah. Ireland, probably. And then we have, in each country, the clubs. And I just had to put Arsenal there, like shoot out to Nivika that has been doing their website. <laughs> so, this is basically the same structure. So, if we think about the concept that we've been looking at and what Iceland has been doing, then we can start thinking, okay, how can we enable people to become better mentors? I would not like to say that we want to start certifying everybody, but we could, for those who want to, we could create a program. Because how does this actually work today? You know, can I see who in here is a mentor? Okay. And who would like to become a mentor? And I would like to see everybody. But how are we going to do that? You know, how, are, how, how do you become a mentor? And that is the question that we are trying to answer. And as Hussein said in his session today, for those who went there or missed it, he said, like, we are all mentors. Mentoring is not to only be helping out with code. Mentoring is to stand here and tell you something. Mentoring is to sit next to somebody and help him with something. 
So you can, you are already a mentor because you're here and you're most likely talking to somebody about some problems that you're having and you're trying to solve that. So these are registered my mentors on Drupal.org. And like mentoring on Drupal.org is a little bit like, you know, I just say that they are my mentors. They don't even have to approve that. I just say like, ah, oh, Rachel, Jan, and Christoph, they are my mentors. And they are like, okay. And then you ask like, for what are they your mentors? Well, I can tell you that. We can go into details. Like Jan introduced me to, where are you Jan? Somewhere, there. He introduced me to the Drupal community. He took me to conferences and like told me and taught me everything like, to like allow me to go and talk there. And, you know, so he's my mentor. You know, Rachel has also been teaching me so much about the Drupal community and how it works. And Christoph has been teaching me about Drupal. But this we don't see here. And my suggestion here is that we need to, as a community, to change this. We need to somehow enable our mentors to get credits for what they're doing. So Michael is organizing sprints in, now in Ashwin, right? Or at least you were in, in, in Vienna. Vienna. No, in, um, in Vienna I was. Yes. In Vienna he was organizing a sprint and he's doing an excellent job. He's been organizing also sprints in, in Heidelberg and in Drupal camps in Frankfurt and Germany. And it says nowhere. Like if you are organizing now a, a Drupal event in your country, who should you contact? You know, do you go on my list and check and you start calling them? You don't know. You need a place where you can go and you can see that he actually likes doing it. And he has been doing it, so he knows how to do it, so you know who to contact. So that's just a suggestion. Uh, suggestion number two and the discussion, it's both like it's just open up for discussions. And this is just about thinking about what has the Icelandic Federation been doing in football and how can we actually learn from that? Because the guys who are now playing in the World Championship they were starting to play football when the Football Federation started to do their program. So we as a community, we have to think about something like that too, to grow our product or project. So I don't know if anybody here, like, you know, you guys in Drupal Camp London, you've been doing this now again, so you know how it is to create a camp. But I did my first camp in Iceland last year. Yeah, have you done, have you organized a camp? Like, you don't even know where to start. And you have to start by finding a logo. Well, then you have to find a designer that is willing to volunteer to create a logo. Then you have to start to create a website. Well, that we can do easily, no. That we cannot do so easily, because we also have to do our jobs. And then we have to create a website. And this goes on and on. Then we have to create a sponsor packages. And how do they actually look like? Do I go for the 1,000 euros or 2,000 euros? And to whom should I talk to? So there are a lot of places. We have Slack channels where we can discuss this. There's also like a, a couple of pages where we can, you know, go at, on. So like last year there were 50 camps in Europe, like 50 of them. And I can just tell you that I know way too many people who've been burning out after organizing an event like this. So this is amazing what they're doing here in London because they're doing it again and again. But that's not always the case because there's often people are just completely like, Done. Like, I have to take a break. And this we need to change because we should not be reinventing the wheel again and again and again. So there has been like all kinds of efforts been tried. Like, we have these websites, you know, where there are Sorry. all kinds of, you know, how do you organize it? There's like, I think yesterday when I was looking at it, I think I found like five or six of different places. And I'm also part of the Drupal camp organizers in, in Drupal Slack, which is not part of the Drupal Slack, it's another Slack. Uh, but who has actually been doing this and mastering this? Do you know this, this concept? So the Rails girls, that's basically, you know, I just, after when you're here, check out their website because they created a concept, and that's basically like, so here is how you organize a camp, and here's all your material, and here's your email template to talk to your sponsor. That's everything is in there. 
There's even a logo you can just use. You can take the logo and you can put your, you know, your city on it. And the nice thing when you go and you look at it, you even say like, so the template for the sponsor is like, we are doing a two-day event at insert city. You know, on this, you know, insert date. So this is really simple. And what has been happening around the world is that women have been taking this concept and they've been creating events to teach other women Ruby or Rex. And this is just, you know, so look at, look at that. We also, like last, last uh, week, we also saw something like this coming out. So we have a lot of, we have a sprint kit, you know, that Rob and, and Jan have been working on and they published that last week. So it's a, it's a kit, like how would you organize this? How can we make our contributors when they come and it's really easy for them to set it up and start contributing? So the good news is, is that last week, the Drupal Association, they announced that they are going to start crediting people who are doing this work. So at least we are one step further. Again, to the mentoring, you know, we are not there yet with the mentors, but we, we will get there. But with the camps, they have been listening. So now they said, okay, we are going to try to connect the camp websites to the Drupal.org profiles, and we are going to give them credits, the people who organize camps. So you can read about that in the ladies' blog. Another great example is the Splash Awards. So the, the Netherlands Drupal Association has been doing Splash Awards since 2014. And they just basically said like, hey, why are not all local, author like local Drupal associations doing this? So Splash Awards is basically you, 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 know, you award the best Drupal projects of the year. So what they did, they have this concept, they have already had, you know, the logo is there, the website is there. So they basically open sourced it. And that's, they're still working on making the website and with all the material, but the German association just took it and set up a Splash Awards. And now the German association has been doing this for two years. Austrians are joining, Norway has already done it, Drupa, uh, Denmark is doing it, Romania, and all of you who are in your own countries organize Splash Awards. Because this will result in a very, very many case studies for Drupal. So if you want to ask questions about that, you can talk to Paris, who's there. Uh, Jam is also hosting Splash Awards. Also in the Netherlands, he's been also, so he's a great host for it. And maybe the suggestion number three is like, how can we make it easier for developers and for people who want to learn Drupal? How can we actually make it easier for them to get training? And this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and then I met Moldova. So Drupal Association in Moldova, they have people on the payroll to work to promote and grow Drupal in Moldova. So what they've been doing is that they created this so-called Drupal school to get developers to certify themselves in Drupal. So it's a two-month program that is like a beginner program, medium and then advanced. And when in the advanced class, you can then go into either site building, back end or front end. But what they did, and they actually, they gave me the material. They, there is an exam in the end. So there is this the program that you can take and you can start teaching Drupal. So we all have access to our, you know, to the universities where we have been at. And this here, that's three times per week. They do two hours. And then on Saturday, Saturday they do an optional. And they basically get a trainer in who knows Drupal and is willing to do this. And then they just put on the program. This is very successful, so please look at the website of theirs. And here is the challenge. How can we take this and we can actually apply this to our local associations so we can start teaching Drupal in our own uh, countries? And I know that they are also up for a discussion about how they can open source their program and do something more with this. So basically there are so many opportunities for us as a community to grow our project 
And that's just the invitation that I want to invite you to, is a discussion about what can we do, how can we learn from, so we, we sometimes in the Drupal community, we are sometimes focusing too much on Drupal, because we think that that's how the world is, but there is also so much other things going on. For example, the Icelandic Football Federation, Association, which are, is, they are doing amazing things, and we should go and we should look at what they are doing, and we should see if we can apply this maybe to our project. And that's a challenge that we have, and we have to do that by creating better, like, better places for our people to grow, which is our main goal, right? So, that's then what comes out of it. <laughs> Like, we're so happy that the community comes together and creates this here. This is also going to be a place where we are going to, this is like a promo, this is the promo, like, sorry. <laughs> but here we are going to uh, have everybody to come together. We are hopefully going to be doing workshops and trainings and at least try to have this discuss discussion again with you guys. So there's ticket for sale now. Check it out, drupalyear.org. <laughs> So thank you for listening. I hope that um, that you get you take something with you home. Uh, now, please, if you have any questions, then please go for it. that we have to have. So I think like what Hussein has been doing in his talks in very many of his sessions in the past, some other Rachel is doing the same. You know, we are trying to get more people involved to become a mentor. And I think that now we have to take this to the next level and we have to take and start to create a place. And that maybe starts with the Drupal Association or it starts with the local associations that we have to start to create something where the mentors can come now today they only like the official office hours is once per week no once per month for only two hours where they meet online of course they are doing all kinds of stuff together themselves but this is the official place and we have to start making this a little bit more uh, public maybe once per week yeah, one more question how can um, the community and um, everyone else um, get involved in um, Drupal um, Europe and how can they help out and contribute? So we have uh, on Drupal Europe, we have uh, on Drupal Slack, we are there and there's a channel, Drupal Europe channel, we have also our email address um, and we are setting now up a, an open uh, project, which is a project management tool where there's going to be like the backlog is just going to be online available to anybody. You don't even have to log in. And then you can start taking tasks. If you see something that's, you know, we need to work on the brochure. And then you say, okay, I want to look into that because that's then going to be public. So we're going to try to get volunteers to start working by having an open project online. And then just ping us, all of us. One more? Yeah, we'll do one more. 
Hey, uh, yeah, so about the reasons why DrupalCon uh, isn't being done anymore. Like, I'm, I, I think I fit in with one of the people who I went to a couple of DrupalCons a long time ago. They were okay. But since then, I've been going to those camps. Drupal Dev Days is amazing. Drupal Business Days is amazing. There's just a much greater sense of community there. Whereas the cons were always these big, scary, glitzy places where it just was, it was both expensive, but also I kind of found them exhausting and it was harder to get things from them compared to the Dev Days and Business Days. So what's your kind of vision for Drupal Europe that differentiates a bit from the Drupal cons of the past? That means it's more likely to be kind of like an exciting thing for European relative to what the, the issues the cons might have had in the past. Yeah, so most important in our, our biggest, or like in the main goal is just to bring us all together. And we are so happy to have venue, like places like Dev Days and Frontend United where certain groups are coming together but we need to have a place where we all come together, where the businesses are going to be the front-enders, the back-enders to work on the project. But we are also trying to, you know, we, we are trying to move a little bit. We are trying to do something that we think is missing, and that's more case studies, that's more of real examples. So we are going to be having more summits about uh, government, publishing. So we are going to be trying to get also other audience in. But most important, what we are working at, is to get all of us together, so we can work on the product. So that's the goal. Uh, if we are going to find a place that can take 1,500 people, it has to be big, so it has a little bit different budget than the camps. So that means that the price is always going to be a little bit higher. But we are trying our best, and the more sponsors we are going to get, the better it's all going to be for us. Right? Did I answer it? Yeah. Good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, have we got time for one more? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Have a go, Ronnie. <laughs> Hello. Um, Thanks for, for, for all the ideas. Uh, I'm wondering how are we striking the balance between, on the one hand, having an established formula for sprints, for events, for, for mentoring, but also having the space for being innovative and having new ideas coming up. Because looking at UEFA, um, half of the potential football players are excluded because they're women. Yeah. Um, we're still battling with the fact that 40 years ago, women were, or clubs weren't even allowed to have women's teams. So if we end up with a formula that is flawed at the beginning, we will have much more problems rectifying it. So how are we keeping most diversity and different types of events coming up? as well as supporting uh, people with existing good practices. Yeah, I think like number one and the most important for diversity is for example to have people coming to events and talk. And that's what we all have to do here. We have to, we have, to have you know, women speakers so there will be more women to come to the, to the talks. That's just a fact. That's, that's how it has always worked out. Um, but we, we need to have this discussion, and that's why we need like, a place like Drupal Europe where we can come and we can discuss this. And we need to discuss these ideas, how we can do that. And still, like, you know, uh, we all know that UFA has a lot of money, you know, so we also have to put that into the formula. You know, there's a lot of money involved, and we, of course, do not have that. But we, on the other hand, have the community to work on it. So we have to have that discussion. I, I don't have an answer. Sorry. The Icelandic women's football team is doing very, very well in the World Club. They have been like, yeah. And the youth team and the, <laughs> and the robotic team. And. <laughs> so thank you.